My father always told me football is a gift from God. And God gave you this gift, just as he gives a song to a musician or a singer. So you have to take care of your health, how you prepare yourself. You always have to respect your opponent. And if you do all that, then you'll be a great player and no one will stop you. It's a story that I have to thank God for because it's such a great story, very emotional. Edson Orantes do Nascimento, Pele. More than just a name, more than just a footballer. Here on the streets of Santos is where Pele's incredible story in football begins. It was in this city that he ruled the world. In Santos, it's impossible to escape his impact. He's a symbol of success and a symbol of Brazil's beautiful game. The son of an undistinguished footballer, he never knew anything other than a footballer's life. He couldn't have become anything else. My mum would always say, I don't want you to play. I don't want you to become a footballer. Look at your father, he's injured. And now we've got serious problems. We don't have enough money to buy food. I want you to be a doctor or a teacher, but definitely not a footballer. But football was in the young Edson's blood. At the age of just 15, he left the family home in Bauru for a trial at Santos hoping to achieve the success that his father had never had. Unsurprisingly, he never returned home. We first saw him when he was only 15, and we knew straight away that he'd be a genius. He was just a kid, but was already training with the professionals. At 15, I trained for the first time with Santos, and after just one training session, they signed me up. And sometimes I joke with my mum after that, saying, Mum, can you imagine if I'd stayed in Bauru and become a teacher? Or a doctor? I had to be a footballer. His ascent to the top happened so quickly that he barely played a game before catching the eyes of the Brazil coach in the run-up to the 1958 World Cup. It was a surprise decision, even for the player himself. I didn't expect to be called up to the Brazilian team. I was only 16 and I wasn't even a regular starter at Santos yet. On the day when everyone was called up, we saw that little black kid and we thought, who's that? In Rio de Janeiro, we didn't know who he was. Despite an injury forcing him out of the first two games, Pelé's impact was devastating. He was instrumental in helping defeat the much-fancied Soviet Union and send Brazil into the latter stages of the tournament. A star had been born. He recovered for the good of football. He was a very strong kid anyway, very muscular. And that's how Pelé emerged into the world of football. The boy who would be king grew in stature as the competition progressed. This goal against Wales was enough to secure a quarter-final win, and he followed that with an imperious hat-trick against France in the semis. We soon saw why a kid of only 16 or 17 had been called up to the Brazilian national team. There were no signs of nerves as Pelé became the youngest player to appear in a World Cup final. After taking a 2-1 lead against host Sweden, Pelé then did this to score the Brazilians third and cement his place in the history of the game. Foi a primeira vez que 
1958 World Cup was the first time the Europeans had ever seen a trick, which we call the hat in Brazil. Back then, the Europeans had never seen anything like it. It was fitting that Pelé should round off the 5-2 win with Brazil's final goal. Inspired by their boy wonder, Brazil had won their first World Cup. The emotions of the occasion proved all too much for the 17-year-old boy. If ever there was a journey that represented Pelé's step from boy to man, then this was it. He went to Sweden relatively untried and unknown. He came back to Brazil as the world's most famous player. And the boy from Bauru took to his newfound status as easily as he'd taken to international football. He was born to be famous. In this aspect, he is someone who craves fame. And he knows how to deal with it. From 1958 onwards, Pelé and Santos were in demand all over the world. Everyone wanted a ticket to the greatest show in town. And Santos's number 10 received the sort of adulation normally reserved for pop stars. Santos played all over Europe. We played a lot there in Germany, Italy, and we rarely ever lost either. I think it's fair to say that Santos became so well known because we toured the world. Everyone wanted to see Santos play, and especially Pelé, the world's greatest player. As the goals reined in, he retained that same humility that had made him such a star in the first place, and his rise to fame as a black man from humble origins resonated globally in an era of civil rights and racial integration. Today you get black players playing in every country in the world. Even in Sweden you'll see black footballers. I'm very proud to be Brazilian and to be black, and so to have made this contribution to the rest of the world. Because the integration you get today began with that Brazilian side. Four years after their World Cup win in Sweden, Brazil travelled to Chile to defend their title. Pelé was now the central figure in a largely unchanged lineup, and he underlined his growing reputation in the Champions opening game against Mexico. But in just his second game, Pelé tore a muscle in his thigh. Consigned to signing autographs off the pitch, his tournament was over. Inspired by the irrepressible Garincha, Brazil still reached the final. Pelé had to be content with a seat in the stands as he watched his teammates cruise to a win against Czechoslovakia to retain their crown. Pelé, ever the team player, was simply happy with the result. Então... The fact that I was injured was compensated for by the fact that Brazil won the World Cup. He only had to wait three months to remind the world what they'd missed in Chile, however. Having been crowned the best in South America, Santos travelled to Lisbon's Stadium of Light to face European champions Benfica in the Intercontinental Cup. I think it was one of the most important matches of my career. Certainly one of the most significant games for me. Benfica had been supremely confident of victory, but Pelé would give them a lesson in football they'd never forget. When we got out onto the pitch, it was 4-0, before they'd even opened their eyes. It was incredible, just a fantastic exhibition of football. Pelé produced a virtuoso display that defied superlatives. A hat-trick and a brutal 5-2 win bore witness to a player at his destructive best. Europe's finest had been humbled. No doubt about it. I reckon that was one of the best games I ever played in my life. No doubt at all. Santos were now regarded as the strongest team in world football. They repeated the feat a year later, thrashing AC Milan in the 1963 Intercontinental Cup final. Pelé and his teammates were unstoppable, becoming a South American equivalent of European giants Real Madrid. We were like a second national team. That was the secret to our success. And then at the heart of it all, we had Pele. 
ainda jovem, né? Santos' number 10 had established himself as the best of a talented generation of Brazilian footballers. He seemed to possess no weaknesses, combining pace and power with grace and subtlety. He had everything that footballer should have. He was a player of the highest level. Even today, I still haven't seen anyone I can compare him to. Pelé made everything look easy. He had great vision, he could dribble, he was quick. Sometimes I had to mark him as he moved about a lot. Whenever Santos were losing, he became a monster. He wanted to win whatever it took. He was intelligent. He was as good with his left foot as he was with his right. I had great close control, which I think I got from my father. It would also take a lot for any player to come from behind and get the ball off me. I never saw him not want the ball on the pitch. He was always up for it, always getting us going. He wanted to win, he wanted to break records, break boundaries. Pelé was fantastic. He was the greatest example of a footballer I've seen in my lifetime. People said it must be easy to play together, as you've played with him for years. But it wasn't that simple to follow the way he played. Because we're talking about a genius here. A hero in his adopted city of Santos, Pelé now had to prove himself all over again on the international stage. In the build-up to the 66 World Cup, he was at his peak, having just top-scored in his ninth consecutive Sao Paulo tournament. Yet chaotic organisation behind the scenes threatened to derail Brazil's World Cup campaign. With only two or three days until our first game, we still didn't know what the team was. So it was really confusing for everyone. Pelé was on target in Brazil's opening win against Bulgaria, but injuries saw him miss their next game as the holders were all too easily dismantled by an ordinary Hungarian side, their first World Cup defeat in 12 years. Up next was a must-win game against Portugal and the man known as the European Pelé, Eusebio. That Brazil team was one of the worst Brazilian sides I've ever seen. Really bad. The players weren't in the right condition. Even Pelé wasn't. I immediately said, we're going to win this. I said that to my teammates, that we're going to win this because we're a good side, we're better than good, we're better than Brazil. It was such a tough World Cup as people have seen. It was the most aggressive tournament that there had ever been, and I got injured. As well as my injury, Brazil also lost their grip on the World Cup. That was a really sad year. In 1966, Pelé was a marked man. The Portuguese subjected him to a series of physical challenges. They claimed, however, that Pelé was already carrying an injury. Pelé was already injured. He came to the World Cup with an injury. It was nothing about us kicking his ankle. We knew that. Even Pelé knew that. But we won, and we won easily. Pelé was reduced to a shadow of the man who'd humbled the bulk of this Portugal side when Santos thrashed Benfica in 62. Eusebio ran Brazil ragged, inspiring the Portuguese to a famous 3-1 win. For Brazil, it had been a tournament to forget. In short, 66 was a disaster. With both a bruised body and ego, an inconsolable Pelé threatened to walk away from football for good. It was after that World Cup that I said, I won't play football anymore. 
I almost made a promise that I'd leave the game behind. Despite the attention from defenders, the goals kept on coming. By November 1969, Pele had scored an incredible 999. He got his chance to make history as Santos played against Vasco da Gama in Rio's Cathedral of Football, the Maracanã. It was becoming awful, as it wasn't helping the team. We were often in positions where we could shoot, myself included, but instead of shooting, we tried to pass him the ball so he could end his torment and get that thousandth goal. With 13 minutes remaining, Santos were awarded a penalty. I looked around and everyone was shouting, Pele, and my legs started shaking. So I thought, oh my God, I can't miss this penalty. Please don't let me miss. Not even when I was 17 and playing in the 1958 World Cup, I wasn't trembling like I was when I went to score my thousandth goal. But thankfully the goal came and today it stands at 1,282 goals. In 1970, Pelé was back with the national team preparing for his fourth World Cup in Mexico. He was only 29 but was now the veteran of the side and the only remaining member of the victorious 58 and 62 teams. In 1970, Pelé still wasn't even 30 years old. He was at the peak of both his physical and technical powers. And I think he also knew that it would be his last chance of playing in a World Cup. We had a very well-organised team. We played with virtually the same team throughout all the qualifying games, so we knew each other very well and how to play together. A gente já conhecia o jogador. Yet if one player was going to stand out in that team, it had to be Pelé. In Brazil's opening game against Czechoslovakia, he played with vigour, determination and imagination, lifting his teammates to a 4-1 win. Brazil had laid down their marker for the rest of the competition and Pelé appeared destined to leave the global stage on a high. In 70, it seemed that he prepared himself for an honourable farewell, worthy of Pelé. He had an incredible World Cup. Pelé knew the significance of 1970. This was his final chance to be the star. From an individual point of view, I think 1970 was Pelé's greatest ever World Cup, but he did it all within the group. He was so intelligent, he played for the team, but obviously still with his characteristic ability for those flashes of individual brilliance. And there were a lot of those in 1970. He always said that Pelé's thought process was so quick that it was several seconds quicker than the rest of us. When you stopped to think about what he was about to do, he'd already done it. With him in the side, the win was guaranteed. As Brazil progressed to the final, Pelé knew his moment had come. A win would confirm his status as the greatest of them all. But even the greats feel pressure. Even the greats have moments of self-doubt. When we were just about to arrive at the stadium and looked out of the window and saw all us Brazilians and Mexicans with the Brazil flag shouting, Brazil, Pele, it just made me well up. I wanted to stop crying, but I couldn't. I tried to hide it as I was the oldest and most experienced player. And I didn't want the other players to think, why is he crying? This was the first World Cup broadcast in colour when the yellow shirts of Brazil, shimmering in the Mexican sun, took on their mythical status. And this was the final that was a testament to some of the finest football ever played by perhaps the finest national team ever to grace the game. On such an occasion, there could only ever have been one man
to open the scoring. I'd scored a header against Sweden in my very first World Cup. And then I scored again with my head in my farewell game against Italy as a world champion. So it was fantastic. Despite an Italian equaliser, Brazil took control of the game. Their efforts were soon rewarded. Although it sounds strange, I think the final against Italy was perhaps the easiest game of the World Cup for us. With just five minutes remaining, there was still time for Brazil to add one more. When the ball came and I saw Fakete follow Jairzinho inside, all I had to do was control it and roll it to the side as I knew what was happening. I didn't even look. I didn't need to. I knew that Carlos Alberto was making the run. I was just lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and get on the end of Pele's pass to score. Twelve years after winning his first World Cup, Pele could now celebrate a record third victory. No longer just the king of Brazil, Pelé was the king of the world. The Brazil side of 1970 had perfectly captured the essence of the beautiful game inside Mexico's Azteca Stadium. And key to it all was their eternal number 10. Without any doubt, it was the World Cup of my life. I prepared myself really well for it, and it was my best World Cup, undoubtedly. It was my best ever year, and as a farewell, I just have to thank God as it was just incredible. After 92 games and 77 goals, Pelé decided to call time on his international career a year later. And back in Santos, he knew his playing days were drawing to a close. After 18 years of loyal service, he played his final game for his beloved club in September 1974. His next decision took everybody by surprise. He went to America and signed for New York Cosmos. It was a, a long, long involved trek to get him, um, but he was the only one worth trying to get to, to lift the game suddenly out of its anonymity into a huge prominence. The goals still came easily and he even helped the Cosmos to an NASL title in 1977. But his main success was in the development of the game in the US. His fame and global appeal ensured that football became one of the country's most popular sports, an appropriate legacy at the end of a glittering career. You would see a crowd like that for a soccer game in the United States, well, he's the man that has caused it. Pele with a hard shot into the goal! A shot into the goal! Pele has scored in his last half for the Cosmos! Since his retirement, Pelé has become an ambassador for the game. A whirlwind of pace and power on the field, intelligent yet humble off it, Pelé transcends the game of football. Pelé's star will never burn out. Because even after all these years, since we've stopped playing, Pelé is still shining wherever he goes. Pelé is a special player. There'll never be another player like him. I've always said that he's like an alien, that he came from Saturn because he did incredible things. I now get to tell my children, my family, even my friends, that I had the extraordinary honour of playing with the guy I consider to be the greatest footballer of all time. He was the complete player. You can't say a man with 1,300 goals is a weakness. He has to be the best. Edson, Arantes, Donacimento, Pele. More than just a name, 
more than just a footballer.